All right, everybody. My son actually decided he wanted to volunteer to share something with us today. So every week I share a heart verse with us, right? We have a memory verse. We want to commit not just to memory but to our hearts. And Deacon was doing an excellent job this week. And so he would like to share our heart verse from last week with us again this week. You remember it? You want to share it? For he himself suffered when he was tempted. He can help others that are being tempted. Hebrews 2.18. So good, buddy. Good job. You can stay up here for a minute. Can the other kids also come up for a second, too? Other kids, just for a minute. I want to ask you guys a question. You can have a seat right here in front if you want. So we're going to talk a little bit the next couple weeks about loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but specifically loving God with all of our heart. Does anybody here know what it means to love God with all your heart? What do you think, Mad? I think it means praise the Lord. To praise the Lord, amen. That's good. Do you have a thought, Deacon? Uh, that, it, that, it, that you use all your heart to love God. Just use all of your heart to love God, right? But So what does it mean to do that with your heart? You have thoughts, Annabelle? What about it? Yes. He just made the whole world. He made the whole world. That's true. Do you have any thoughts, Colson? I feel like I died here and die right now. Yeah, it's all right if you don't have anything right now. That's good. Thank you guys for sharing a little bit. Uh, so we're going to talk about loving God with all of our heart today. And you guys have special bulletins today, don't you? I'll show you, everyone else, what they look like. We have kids' bulletins this week that they have to do. They have some fun colors on them. But you also have a coloring page on the very back of it, right? And this coloring page, you already colored yours. That's okay. Uh, but it has to do with our passage today, John 12, 1 through 8, where we're going to see two different people who respond to Jesus emotionally, one of them who washes Jesus' feet and the other one who has some things to say about that. So as you listen to, uh, to Pastor Corey talking today, uh, you can color your pictures and be thinking about the Bible story, okay? Let's go ahead and go back to your seats. It's all right. Good job, guys. Thank you. So as I said, we're going to be talking about loving God with all of our heart today. And uh, a lot of that, you know, whether it's talking about praising God or talking about um, uh, you know, giving all of ourselves to him. The, the verse there, the great commandment that we're given to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength really has to do with just everything that we are, right? Those other three categories, our mind, our soul, our strength, are sometimes easier to wrap our heads around. You know, loving God with all your mind is, I want to believe all of the right things. Loving God with all your strength, I want to do all of the right things he's commanded. But sometimes that idea of our heart is harder for us to think about how do we do that the right way? Our heart often has to do with our emotions and how do you just control the way that you feel, right? How do you disciple how you feel? My wife and I like to believe that we're pretty emotionally mature, but all of a sudden when you're trying to parent four kids and, uh, and also teach them how to deal with their emotions, it gets real difficult real sometimes. <laughs> you, you lose a lot of patience and you find out you're not necessarily as uh, as mature as you thought you were or as developed as you thought you were. Well, today we're going to look at, as I indicated to the kids, a passage in John chapter 12, which shows two different reactions, uh, emotional reactions, that I think will help us to just reflect on this a little bit of what it looks like to love God with all of our heart or to not, to do it in unhealthy ways. So we're going to be in John chapter 12 today. I'm reading from the New International Version. Verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor, and Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. 
Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Let's pray. Lord, we bless the uh, reading of your word today. We pray that it might be nourishing to our spirits to help us to know you more. And as we reflect on it this morning and what it means to love you with all of our heart, we pray that you might open our eyes, our hearts, our spirits, our ears to hear and to receive what it is you have for us today. We pray that in your name. Amen. You may have heard the phrase, don't skip leg day, whenever you're exercising. Results sometimes in very out of balance sorts of physique. I, oftentimes when I think about it, I just think of like the silly image that's up there. But as I was uh, hearing it again recently, I realized there was more than just the look of it. It's not just about the aesthetics. It's actually very, very important that you do have a, a developed lower uh, part of your body so that you have stability. If you're working out and you're getting uh, really big up top, it's great if you're trying to lift stuff up, I guess, but you're very easily knocked off balance. If you don't have a strong uh, lower part of your body in order to anchor yourself to the ground, allow the tension to rise up to your core and to your, to your upper body, uh, you're going to be pushed around very, very easily. So it's important not to skip leg day. Uh, well, we just talked about the, the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. I'd like to suggest that in a similar way, we can never skip heart day. When we're, when we're talking about our spiritual health, you can't skip heart day. It's the foundation for which everything else works. You might have a really developed mind. You might have a really developed uh, you know, service life. Uh, and witness, but if you don't deal with the heart issues, you're going to be really easily pushed around, really easily knocked off balance. And so our, my message for today is called failures of heart. And my one key point that I want to uh, drive home to you today as we reflect on this is that emotional immaturity and dysfunction, it will debilitate your spiritual life and witness. Emotional immaturity and dysfunction will and can debilitate your spiritual life and your witness. Why do I say that? Uh, Judas was, from every outside indicator, worthy of uh, being a disciple among the twelve. Enough so that none of the other disciples suspected him whenever Jesus at the Last Supper was telling them, hey, one of you is going to betray me really interesting in the chapter right after this one in John uh, 13 he is telling them hey one of you among me is gonna, going to betray me and they're all looking around is it me is it me who is it who is it and then he even tells them specifically uh, in John 13 uh, we'll start in verse uh, 26 he says Jesus answered it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then he dips uh, a piece of bread and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. So he's telling everyone, this is the guy who's going to betray me. And as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Uh, Jesus told him, what you're about to do, do quickly. It says, but no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought that Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. Even though Jesus specifically indicates to them, hey, this is the person, and then does that, they still, they still don't believe it's Judas because he's been with them the whole time. And from the outside indicators, they have no reason to believe that he would do something like that. 
So why is that significant? I'd argue that's significant because it shows us that what happened to Judas could happen to any of us. Judas was following Jesus. He was hearing all of the same things, learning all of the same knowledge, doing all of the same ministry things the other 12 did, and yet there were things within him that made it possible for him to fall away in a really profound and, and, and negative sort of way. So the question is, how do we prevent it? How do we keep ourselves from that kind of dysfunction? Uh, there's a book that I'll be referencing throughout this series called uh, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And it's by a guy named Pete Scazzaro. And in it, he talks about, in the very first chapter, the danger signs, the symptoms of emotionally unhealthy spirituality. And I want to share some of those with you today and see some ways in which uh, Judas displays those, but also Mary, in contrast, uh, displays the, the healthy sort of characteristic there. We'll see, not all of them that, that Pete shares in this book will necessarily be reflected in the text, but, uh, but many of them are. If you have your bulletins today, you also, uh, if you're a note taker, there's spaces for you to fill in the blanks there. So uh, I did that specifically for our note takers today. The first danger sign, the first symptom of emotionally unhealthy spirituality is using God to run from God. Using God to run from God. This is what happens when we use all sorts of religious activity to keep ourselves so distracted that we don't actually have to spend time with God. You know, spiritual activity, spiritual habits, and discipline, they're helpful when they draw us into the presence of God, to be vulnerable and to be transformed. And we were talking about the different spaces of discipleship uh, in the last series that we were in. In our private devotional life with God, we, we saw that the right move, the best thing to do there was to uh, be reflective and have vulnerable time and intimacy with God. That our prayer, that our Bible reading, our study, any of those practices that we do are effective only in as much as they draw us to a sense of vulnerability before God to be transformed by Him. We can't do enough praying. We can't do enough scripture reading. We can't do enough... Uh, of serving or any of those things in order to transform ourselves. It's all in, in vulnerability and surrender before God that that happens. Um, and so in any other context, any of those spiritual activities, they're just hopeless efforts to distract ourselves from our broken and our sinful condition. When we are unhealthy, we use all of this godly kind of activity to actually run from God's presence to run from being uh, real before him and to, to sit with ourselves in our brokenness. We see this in the text because Judas, he sounds kind of pious in this text, right? He says, we should be using this to serve the poor, right? We should be using this to help other people. In other gospel passages that, uh, like in, in Luke and in, in Matthew, when they tell this same story, they don't actually name that it was Judas, who was the one who spoke up. It just says the disciples uh, were talking about this and, and they objected to Mary's actions, uh, saying that we should have given this to the poor. That doesn't mean that, that uh, John is wrong. It just means that John's the only one who identified Judas as the one who said, who said it first. So Judas speaks this up, but no one's like objecting to his statement. They're all saying, yeah, what he's saying makes sense. They all agree to this because it sounds pious. It sounds right. Uh, like, we should be taking care of the poor. This seems like a waste uh, to take this incredibly ex expensive thing and just waste it in this way that seems kind of socially uncomfortable for them, too. Um, they all agreed with what he said. So the problem, though, is that this pious front that he's giving, it's hiding this huge disconnect that Judas had from his own emotions, probably even himself. He didn't realize it. But you contrast that to Mary, her actions seemed like not only a waste, but a bit socially awkward and uncomfortable, but she understood the moment. She understood how important Jesus was. And if you look back in chapter 11, Mary had just witnessed Jesus raise her brother from the dead, right? She had just witnessed this incredible moment of his his power 
of his lordship. Nobody else could do what he did. So she understood his identity. And she was right there along everyone else when Jesus was telling them exactly what was about to happen next, that he was going to give his life. He was going to be surrendered over to the authorities. He was going to be crucified. She understood the moment. She ignored any of the social graces in that moment and instead, out of a, an act of emotion but also an act of adoration and reverence, she gives this incredible gift that seems like a waste, but for him, it means the world to him in that moment. So she's not using God to run from God. She is running to God. Right? The second symptom is ignoring emotions of anger, of sadness, of fear. You might also talk about shame or loss, any of these negative emotions. My pastor growing up uh, used to always say that Christians should be the happiest people on earth. Uh, and I, I would have some bones to pick with him about that sometimes when he would say that. I'm like, There's some negative things that happen sometimes, right? When people uh, that we love pass away, when, uh, when hard things happen in the world, it's okay to be sad. And he wasn't necessarily trying to say that, uh, that we should never grieve. His intention was to point out that we have a joy in us that can sustain us through the darkest times, that, that Christians should have this sort of um, joy that we don't ever grieve like other people grieve, but we, we are able to have this joy within us at all times that bubbles over. But the unintended message that was conveyed is that negative emotions are somehow unspiritual. Ever, anybody ever feel like that or felt like that was communicated to them before, that if you were grieving, if you were sad, if you doubted, if you had any sort of negative emotional response to things, that somehow you were out of bounds of the correct response of faith. When we don't give ourselves permission to admit and express our feelings openly, what really happens is we only hide them in the dark, where Satan has more ability to use them to twist us up to wreak havoc, wreak havoc on us. Now, Judas clearly had some doubts and fears in response to the direction that Jesus was taking his ministry. Perhaps he was feeling uh, anger or sadness that, um, that Jesus wasn't acting in the ways that Judas thought the Messiah should act. And if he had actually dealt with those emotions, maybe even had a conversation with Jesus about it, who knows how things might have turned out differently. We know that Mary also had doubts and fears and sadness. In the last chapter, when her brother Lazarus had died, when Jesus shows up after Lazarus' death, she did not hesitate to lay it all out there. If you had been here, Jesus, my brother wouldn't have died. If you had been here. And what's interesting is Jesus does not take issue with her statement there. It says... That Jesus wept. He joined her in her sadness. And he brought new life to Lazarus as well. The book of Psalms also, it's, it's filled with anger, with sadness, with fear, with, with doubt even sometimes. David, who's described as a man after God's own heart, he wrote most of the Psalms. And they show us this model of how to process through our emotional responses to the world around us. We read in Psalm 51 uh, this morning at the beginning of our service, uh, David processing through uh, his guilty conscience. Psalm 51 was actually written after the whole David and Bathsheba episode where he had, had some enormous failures in, in his life. And he responds to God with a contrite heart, with humility. There's other places where he expresses his anger over the situation of, of the moment where he expresses his lament uh, over, and his sadness over the circumstances of his life. And processing through those allows him to turn it back to praise at the end. The book of Psalms is an, a guidebook for us as Christians to explore our emotions, to love God with all of our heart over the whole gamut of the emotional spectrum, right? So we shouldn't ignore the emotions of anger, sadness, and fear but be able to, in a healthy way, recognize them, express them, eventually learn 
to cope with negative things, but also then to regulate, to process through. And when we really get to a space of emotional, emotional maturity uh, and, and loving God with all of our heart, to be able to harness even those, those negative emotions in a way that we can do positive good for the kingdom of God. The third symptom is dying to the wrong things. We know that when Jesus calls us, we're called to come and die, to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross, and to follow Jesus, right? Yet, this isn't a call to become a completely different person. Jesus is calling us to uh, die to the sinful and broken uh, patterns of the world that have marred the image of God within us and to come alive again in him to the good image of God that, he, that was created within us and to the restored image that he is creating in us. We see Judas dying to the wrong things as well. Judas rightly experiences after all of this, after his portrayal of Jesus, this deep sense of conviction very quickly, actually, after his betrayal. But his self-denial goes into such an unhealthy direction that he unalives himself, right, afterward. He ceased to believe that there's anything that's redeemable in himself. So he takes it into his own hands, and he destroys the life that God created in love. And that even then, right, even then, Judas's denial of self, it's about himself and not about Jesus. Mary denies herself in a very different way. She buys this costly perfume, and she pours it out to anoint Jesus' feet. For her, she's dying to the right things. It's about Jesus and not about her. Right? Fourth symptom is to deny the past's impact on the present. To deny the past's impact on the present. It can be easy for us to fall under the illusion that after accepting Jesus, our old lives are no longer in us to any degree. For some of us, the past is painful and we want to forget it and to never look back. The good news is, in some situations, God does do this incredible renewal for our lives. For some addicts, for some people who have come from certain backgrounds, God will do this like incredible 180 in their lives. They never even have the, the same um, sort of temptation that they did before. And that's a great grace that, that Christ can give in those moments. But it doesn't happen all the time. And even in those moments, it doesn't mean that the past experiences of a person's life, the past relationships, will completely change all of a sudden. We know that the past still impacts the present. And the glorious good news of the gospel is that we have been declared righteous before God. Nothing about our past or even our present or even our future sins are held against us because we are righteous through Christ before God. Amen? But we also know that in the same way that sin has so thoroughly complicated our world and, and broken our world, that Jesus seeks to so thoroughly and completely change us from the inside out. And sometimes that requires us to revisit and go back through the stuff of the past in order to find healing, in order to find restoration, in order to find uh, a way to move forward in health. The fifth symptom is dividing life into secular and sacred compartments. Secular and sacred compartments. Uh, I imagine most of us are familiar with that image of... Uh, someone who goes to church on Sunday and is one way in church and then a completely different way the rest of their lives. Uh, we know that that's a, it's cl cliche for a reason because it, it happens a lot. Um, but in, in terms of our emotions, it can go deeper than that. Sometimes the reason for that is not always because people are being intentionally hypocritical. That can happen. But sometimes it's because we have so compartmentalized our hearts, that we have a part of ourselves that we, we react one way with God, and we react a completely different way with the world, and we've locked these parts of our heart and our spirit away from God, not allowing him to really transform us, to really have anything to do with that. These things are of God. These things are sacred. These things are not. And so I behave one way here and one way here. 
But God wants all of our hearts, right? And we see this somewhat on display here in the text. For Judas, care for the poor is a spiritual thing. He's, he's caring about that. But this kind of extravagant adoration that Mary is putting on display, that's not a sacred thing. That's only the perfume, that's a worldly thing, right? You wouldn't do that kind of thing. Um, he's not seeing the larger picture at, at, on display where Mary is saying, all of this is gift. All of this belongs to him in the first place. And so she's turning it back in worship. I'd suggest a question for us. What, what parts of our lives are we keeping shuttered from God? What parts of... How might uh, the sacred things be right there waiting to be discovered and revealed in the spaces that we, we label as secular, out of God's reach? Are there things like that in your life? I'm not going to spend too much time on that, though, because we have five more things to go, so let's keep going. The next symptom, doing for God instead of being with God. Doing for God instead of being with God. This is very similar to the first symptom, um, which was to use God, to run from God. But doing for God instead of being with God is specifically about ministry work and things that we do in order um, to try to, uh, to earn God's approval or in order to try to please God in those different ways. It's not just about the busyness of spiritual activity. It's not just about uh, you know, making sure we're a part of a whole bunch of different Bible studies or, or doing different devotionals or all these things, but it's, it's specifically trying to perform in such a way that we are doing good for the kingdom, which sounds like a good thing, right? It's obviously uh, important for us to do those things. We ask the questions of like, how productive am I for God really? How much impact am I really making for the kingdom? There are lost souls out there. There's work that really does need to be done, and if I don't do it, who will? And so we can get wrapped up in this, like, I got to go, I got to do, I got to do, which is good. It's important for the gospel mission. And it's the mission that Jesus has given us. It, we should be about it. But we also know that work for God that isn't nourished by a life with God, it can very easily be derailed and become all about our ego, all about what we're doing. And become easily wrapped in, up into our sinful desires for approval rather than loving God with all of our heart and saying, I want to do this because I love the Lord. It's a grateful response for what he's done for me, which is what Mary's doing. It can become about, I, I desire, I have this emotional need for approval from others. I have this, this need to be validated. That's, that's, a, that's more of a negative sort of emotion that we have, that we're driven to, I need to do in order that other people can validate my existence. Seven, the next symptom, is that we spiritualize away conflict. Spiritualize away conflict. This one I'm going to uh, give less time as well, because I did a whole long series on this uh, earlier this year, right, where we talked about what it looks like to... Uh, um, uh, to love one another and to confront one another and to make peace and, nav uh, make, uh, peace and navigate conflict. Uh, one of the things that we discovered in some of our discussions on things is that we often ignore conflict instead, uh, and instead we show grace to people, right? Which is good. We are supposed to show grace for people in uh, occasions and when like, this is not a serious enough thing to have like, a whole big thing about. But often what can happen is we show grace, but really we're just nursing resentment inside. Uh, we have two options. Healthy Christians do not avoid conflict. You have two options as a Christian. You either actually show grace, and you say, this isn't really a conflict, this isn't big enough uh, of a deal to, to do anything about. There was a wrong here, but it's probably not going to happen again, and, uh, and it hasn't really damaged the relationship, and they're going in a healthy way so I can just show grace in this circumstance. Or you can have a conversation. Those are the two options that you have. Show grace or have a conversation. But often what we will do is to spiritualize it away. To say, 
oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's just not that big of a deal, or uh, God's working on them, it's all right. And we, we use all of these rationalizations in order to not actually have the difficult conversation when we need to. Number eight, covering over brokenness, weakness, and failure. Covering over brokenness, weakness, and failure. Just like we often avoid negative emotions, it's never easy to acknowledge weakness. We know that the first step in any recovery is admitting that you need help, and that's often the hardest part. I heard a story recently about a comedian named uh, John Mulaney uh, who had had a really rough year or so, and uh, he ended up having an an intervention staged by his friends. And uh, he was talking about it in this interview and he was like, as soon as he walked into the apartment and he saw his friends in a circle, he immediately knew what was happening. Like, he immediately knew it was an intervention. And he was like, okay, okay. Uh, and the funny thing was, reflecting on it in hindsight, he said, is that even in the time of the intervention, which was super uncomfortable, those are not, like, comfortable scenarios, even then he was aware, like, that he wanted to, he needed to be the smartest person in the room. And so uh, as people were, like, saying things, and try, he was like, I know what an intervention is. Okay, like he kept like trying to stop things and like try to prove that he knew what was going on and it, it was okay. Uh, and that's just a, a proof, I think, an example of the ways in which we have this pressure to present this positive image in ourselves, of ourselves. It's a natural thing that we do. It's very, very enticing, even when we're obviously in a very broken place. We, we want people to not see how weak we are, how vulnerable we are. It's interesting. Notice what Judas' sin is that's that's revealed in this, right? He's talking about, like, oh, we should be giving to the poor. And what's he doing? He's dipping into the purse and taking care of himself, right? Into the money bag. Uh, He has a financial thing that he's working through. He's trying to uh, uh, paint himself as this pillar of virtue and generosity and good stewardship, right? When... He himself is dealing inside with all sorts of stuff that's, that's not right there. Uh, Mary, in contrast, does not care what other people think, right? She, she's just letting it all out. She's like uh, pouring perfume. She's wiping him with, his, with his, her hair, wiping his feet. Uh, she doesn't care what other people think about him. She's not worried about trying to cover over brokenness or vulnerability or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, instead, she is secure in her identity. Jesus. The ninth symptom is to live without limits. Living without limits. This one often builds off of the other ones. In our desire to win approval from others or to avoid conflict, we fail to say no to anyone or to any particular opportunity. So in his book on emotionally unhealthy, uh, on emotionally healthy spirituality, this author, Pete Scazzaro, he tells a story about uh, his own struggles with uh, feeling unable to say no to people. He was a people pleaser. That happens often among uh, people in ministry. And uh, he tells a story about a time when there was this couple who wanted to come and speak with him after church, uh, which is not a super abnormal thing, but he had done it, like had people over a lot in the last month or so, and, uh, and his family kind of needed some more personal time, but he just couldn't say no. And so this, uh, he's like, okay, sure, come on over for, for lunch, we'll, we'll chat. And uh, his wife was like very not happy about the whole thing. And uh, the, the husband and this couple was just like, would not stop talking. And they couldn't get a word in edgewise. And it was going on and on and on. Uh, and they couldn't even like say, all right, hey, we maybe need to wrap this up. Thanks for coming or anything like that. They couldn't do any of that. And his wife is getting more and more flustered as they're there. And then... She makes some comment of like, oh, hey, I haven't seen Grace in a while, uh, their three-year-old daughter. And then she's getting more worried. And then they notice it's like really quiet. They're not hearing their daughter in the other room. And uh, and Pete's wife gets really nervous. And she says, I'm going to go check. And she walks out of the room for a second. And then comes back in. I can't find her anywhere. And then both Pete and his wife say at the same time, the pool. And they run out back and they find their daughter who's just like up to her chin 
just like struggling to stay above water. And she's okay. They save her. But he, that's, that was his come to Jesus moment where he realized his inability to say no risked his daughter's life. His inability to put up healthy limits in his life was putting other people in danger. We don't see this one, this uh, living without limits thing, directly in the text. But often, you know, we talked about Judas's financial temptation. Often that kind of thing uh, results not simply from selfish desire, but from great needs that can come in our lives because we've overextended ourselves. Uh, often people who, who end up resorting to things like, uh, like theft are in very desperate situations and sometimes because they haven't been able to manage limits in their own lives. We rationalize our own failures and our own sin by looking at the good being done elsewhere. Well, yeah, this might be wrong and unhealthy, but I mean, at least, at least I'm caring for other people, right? Or at least I'm making space for other... We, we look at all the good things and we can see that and we don't see the harm that's being done and to really notice the cost. And that leads us to the last one. The last symptom is judging the spiritual journey of others. It is way easier to see the fault in other people than it is to see the fault in ourselves. Because we know the justifications that we have for our own actions, right? We know all of the rationalizations that we make to excuse the behavior that, uh, that we're doing. We don't see that in someone else's life. Sometimes we might practice empathy and see it and like, okay, I want to show grace for them. But it's often way easier for us to see our, the, the, all of the justifications for ourselves than for someone else. Judas has no problem pointing out what he sees as problematic behavior from Mary, the waste that she's giving. He has judgment upon this. Now, it's interesting, you know, Jesus doesn't say, he doesn't teach that we should never have anything to say about the choices of a brother or sister that they make. There are times in which we do need to rightly assess a situation and, uh, and risk the offense there in order to point out the potential danger of someone's actions. There's times when we do need to actually speak into someone else's life, and that can feel like judgment from them, but we do need to assess and to speak into it there. Jesus actually tells us both, don't judge or you will be judged. We know that from Matthew 7, 1, and Luke 6, 37, 38. But he also says in John 7, 24, stop judging by appearances and judge correctly, right? The key is Jesus' further statements in, in those uh, scenarios when he says, we will be judged with the measure with which we me uh, judge other people. The measure that we pour out to others, we will be measured to ourselves. The point is that we we look to ourselves and, and measure ourselves in the same way that we would look to others to seek each other's good, right? And to give the same amount of grace that we would give with ourselves. So if you find yourself like Judas, quick to point out the potential faults of others, but strangely incapable of seeing any of the faults in yourself, that might be a symptom that there's something you need to address in your heart. Now, notice the language there. In all of these, these are all symptoms, right? These are all not talking about whether you are a good person or a bad person. This is the language of healthy or unhealthy. These symptoms aren't about judging worth or performance. It's about diagnosing illness. Diagnosing when things and assessing when things are not right, not healthy, not operating as they should in a way that has been, it's been designed. As I walk through that list, you might have find yourself, uh, found yourself identifying with one or more of those items and maybe even started uh, feeling a sense of shame or guilt wash over you. Uh, or maybe you were reading one of those and been like, oh, I know someone who does that, and, uh, and, and pointing out those things. Guilt isn't helpful. Guilt isn't helpful here any more than it's helpful to feel guilty over being diagnosed for cancer, right? That doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you feel guilty about that? 
Uh, maybe there can be lifestyle choices that contribute to things. Maybe there's things that are just environmental. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter, right? Feeling guilty doesn't help you to heal. The first step, as with any journey of recovery or change, is to recognize that there's a problem that needs to be addressed. That's the first step. Not to feel guilty over it, but to recognize it, know that it needs to be addressed, and to, to try to find a path of healing. The good news, the amazing good news, is that change is absolutely possible in Jesus. That is the gospel message, right? That there is hope for transformation in our lives, renewal, that Jesus has died so that we might live. He died and resurrected to show that there's victory over death, victory over all the powers of sin and shame and fear. And all of that stuff has been put to death through the cross. God loves you right here where you are, and he loves you enough to not let you stay there, to not let you stay sick. Uh, we sang the hymn earlier, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Have you ever thought about how weird of a metaphor that is? Blood does not wash things away. Like, I would never wash my clothes in blood. Why would you do that? That's a really weird uh, image to think about. Uh, in the Old Testament sacrificial system, though, all the sacrifices were considered as things that cleansed. And how did that work? How did sacrifice ever cleanse someone? It cleansed them by allowing the people of Israel to sense the weight of their sin before God. That they would identify their sin being imputed to this goat or this lamb or whatever was being sacrificed. There's even, they had to like lay their hand on the sacrifice that they were giving. It's kind of a, a way of recognizing as you're staring into the eyes of this in, innocent animal, the, the cost of life that was being given and that you are going to be forgiven, to have mercy shown to you. So you accept the great cost of God's mercy with gratitude, and it helps you to change your life. That visual symbol of his mercy, of the great weight of your sin. If we are grateful for the sacrificial gift of an innocent life uh, in an animal that's, that's being given, how much more the gift of the perfect Son of God gave his life. That we see in Jesus all of the weight of our sin, all of it given on him, the one true perfect God himself giving his life for us. It cleanses us because it's the truest scene and display of his mercy, of his love given for us that costs everything. It's not cheap. It costs everything. And so when we remember it, when we remember the precious blood of Jesus, the old rugged cross, when we, when we remember that, it cleanses away our guilt, our shame, and it helps us to remember to be washed in his love. So when we draw closer to God in vulnerability and in surrender, God draws even closer to us and he transforms us so that we can desire what's good. So if any of these symptoms um, are in your life, you're not doomed by them. Instead, we know that we can find healing in him. That he can help us in our emotional mature, immaturity, in our emotional dysfunction, in any of those ways in which um, our can sometimes seem like ticking time bombs, things that can, can throw us off track. That he can direct us, he can heal us, he can mature us so that we can actually desire what's good and to truly love God with our whole heart. Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful for the hope that we have in you. We're thankful, Lord, that even even though we are fallen and broken, even though our hearts are so prone to wonder, that you give us a hope that we actually can love you in a way that's honoring to you, that we can give our hearts to you and be 
transformed by you, to be conformed to you, to be matured by you, Lord, in order to be a witness to your name. We pray that in every way that we can, that we would be conformed to your image. Amen. I don't know about you guys, but when I saw that list up there and I started thinking, oh yeah, okay, that looks, that sounds familiar, okay. I got a little anxious. It's like, oh, wow, okay, I got some things to work on. I don't know if anybody else felt that way, but Corey said something at the end there that washed all that anxiety away. It's not me that has to do the work here. It's Jesus through me that's going to do the work. Let's stand and sing that truth today. I want to encourage you, in your bulletins, the, uh, we have a reflection question. How can you draw closer to God today? A few options on here. Maybe you can invite God into your decision-making in your life. Maybe you need to be able to in- intentionally share your feelings with Him or to spend more time with Him each day. Or maybe as we went through those symptoms, you realize there's something, God, that I need you to, need to invite you into my heart to help me work through this. I would encourage you, if anything has uh, impressed upon you today, to take the moment to make the note for yourself. Or maybe uh, around the lunch table, the dinner table tonight, as you're with your family, to process through things. Uh, it's important that we, we take steps to move forward. If any of you have ever been through a doctor appointment where you found out uh, there was something that you needed to work on, you needed to make a life change, it, it usually means a change to your diet or a change to some other things, right, um, that are not always easy, but it's more helpful when you have people that are doing it with you, when you have a system of support, right? And so I would encourage you not just to make a, uh, a, an internal thing, but to share your journey with others in whatever way you can. Let's share our heart verse today. Psalm 119.11. Be on the screen here. Let's say it together. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Just as we read and talked about last week, uh, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, it wasn't just his scripture knowledge that helped him, but it was the fact that uh, he was so rooted to the Father the word. I pray that we might have God's word so in us that it indwells in us and helps us to love him with all of our heart. Let's pray together the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go in peace.